Without further ado, can I welcome Professor Rex Nettleford, who is going to, in a short while, be addressing us. I'll give you just a wee bit of information about him because some of us here know quite a lot about him. Some might not know, but so that you don't get tired of hearing my voice, you haven't come to hear me actually, you've come to hear the professor and all he has to say. A bit of background about him. Professor the Honorable Rex Netterford, Order of Merit, is an internationally renowned Caribbean scholar, trade union educator, social and cultural historian, and political analyst. He was, up until recently, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, based in Mona, Jamaica, with campuses also in Trinidad and Barbados. He was awarded his London BA Honours Degree in History at the University College of the West Indies. He studied at Oriel College in Oxford in 1957 as a Rhodes Scholar and was awarded the Masters in Philosophy. He's now an Honorary Fellow of Oriel Oxford. He returned to Jamaica and held a number of academic posts, rising quickly up the ladder to, as I said earlier, becoming Vice Chancellor until his recent retirement. He was recently honored by the University of the West Indies and its alumni during the institution's annual commemoration celebrations and alumni week. He also was honored as one of four Rhodes Scholars and given an honorary degree of Doctor of Civil Laws of Oxford University in their centenary year. Professor Rex Netterford is the founder and artistic director of the Caribbean's premier dance company, the National Dance Theatre Company of Jamaica, and he's regarded as a leading Caribbean authority on the performing arts. It goes on to mention about the numerous amount of books that he has written, and I'm sure us in this technological age can easily well just put his name into the Google search and you'll see a lot of things about him there. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming Professor Rex Netterford to give us a talk on the Caribbean's creative diversity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me say how very happy I am to be back in Birmingham. Um, I have been here a number of times and I've seen changes which younger ones than myself might not have seen. But Birmingham has actually changed beyond recognition at the time when I came here very many years ago when I was a student in England. Um, I am particularly interested in having audience with you on this, this topic because I feel that it is something which is of global importance at this time in human development and that the Caribbean, or in its own flawed state, has something to offer in this respect. Because what we have been experiencing over the past 400 years um, within written history and with a level of consciousness which has been evident among our forebears and our own compatriots of contemporary times um, has become something new to a great many people in this part of the world. And by examining what um, we in the Caribbean have been doing and where we are at the moment, you may be able to draw some, some lessons from that. In any case, most of you in this room, if not all, are creatures of that very process and your own exit from the Caribbean and your own or rather your presence here is in fact an indication of how the world is moving where it is going. Um, I'm particularly happy to be in this particular facility for um, many reasons not least among them the fact that this is a strategic collaboration between Asia, or parts of it, and the Caribbean, and all that that implies. Um, as I was saying to a group this afternoon, and I, I, and I did it some uh, two evenings ago in Leicester, the last time Asia and Africa got together in any global sense 
um, something very important happened to the world. I referred to the Bandung Conference and the result of that, of the recommendations coming out of that conference and the aftermath of it, which was the, the beginning of the active decolonization of the world, of the Western world, leading to new relationships between people in the North Atlantic and people down south, across the equator. Africa and Asia have not met again with the kind of seriousness that they did then. And the consolidation of that, of the fruits of that process, um, is not quite um, with us. Hence, the need to speak on this topic and your own concerns here in Birmingham and in other parts of the United Kingdom. The other thing that fascinates me, of course, about this facility is that its title is the drum. And the drum as a symbol um, is something that connects the entire world. All civilizations have drums. In one way or another, um, even in the Caribbean, when the drums of Africa were banned because they were used in ritual ceremonies which were felt to be pagan, unchristian, and threatening to um, our then masters. The idiophonic substitution um, were invented by the people to this day, if you want to have fun in Trinidad, you just take two bottles and knock them together. And above all, um, we can use our breath and our mouths so that in Pocomania or revival, revivalism, which you find in a place like Jamaica and elsewhere in the region, the drum wasn't used, couldn't be used, but the people substitute <laughs> and this of course became very important in the whole ritual of Pocomania. However, in revival, Zion revivalism, they introduced what was acceptable to the masters, again the drum, which was modeled on the naval drums, which were the kettle drum, um, beaten with two sticks. And um, that you will find all over the region um, as a substitution. But the African drums never died out. Um, they were either hidden um, later on um, with emancipation or just before. They turned, they turned up again as in Kumina where you um, had the, the, the drums which were hewn out of trees tree trunks, and then much later, the influence of Cuba and Latin, Latin America, the conga drums came in. And you'll find the, those, in fact, all over the Caribbean now. So the drum is the tassa drum of the Indians who did not come as slaves and were therefore not deprived of their cultural expressions. The tassa um, drum came in. And of course, the interesting thing is that the Trinidadians decided to recycle the steel pan, the oil drums, and then invented what is arguably the only acoustic instrument of the 20th century, the steel pan. And that, of course, is definitely a percussion instrument and used the way the drum is. The bass guitar, of course, substituted for the drum in reggae and so on. So you will find the heavy beat in reggae and in the synthesizers built into the technology and all of that so the drum is ever present. So I'm particularly um, happy to be here because it is an integrating instrument for people of different um, civilizations. Now an appreciation of the history 
of the Caribbean region is critical to a fuller understanding of contemporary realities and future challenges. For the Caribbean shares in the great drama of the Americas, of which it is an integral part, whereby new societies are shaped, new and delicately tuned sensibilities are honed, and appropriate designs for social living are crafted through the cross-fertilization of disparate elements. The process has resulted in a distinguishable and distinctive entity called Caribbean. The process is intensely cultural. And I point this out because you will find that that is the solution wherever um, different cultures have met. The resolution of the inevitable conflicts takes place through the exercise of the creative imagination. The encounter of Africa and Europe on foreign soil, and these in turn with the indigenous Native Americans on their long-tenanted estates, and all in turn with later arrivals, later arrivals from Asia and the Middle East, has resulted in a culture of texture and diversity held together by a dynamic creativity severally described as creative chaos, stable disequilibrium, or cultural pluralism. An apt description then of the typical Caribbean person is that he or she is part African, part European, part Asian, part Native American, but totally Caribbean. <laughs> to perceive this is to understand creative diversity, and many of us in the region have been forced to understand it because it's a lived reality. The understanding comes through in the interesting orientation one finds in the region among those who are not yet existing in the independence mode. French Caribbean, which constitutionally is metropolitan France overseas, despite the, the cultural differences between Paris and the capital of Guadeloupe, the Netherlands Antilles, the British dependencies of Anguilla, Montserrat, Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, and Turks and Caicos, all recently elevated to, quote, capital overseas territories, the American dependencies of Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, despite Puerto Rico's commonwealth status, and of course Bermuda. Bermuda, which is a very special case, are more, none of them willing to risk the agony of choice in becoming independent at this time. Uh, somebody of my generation could not think otherwise than becoming independent. When I got my blue passport, which was the independent Jamaica's passport, because before that I traveled quite a bit to this country, and I, I traveled as a subject of um, the United Kingdom and colonies. So I was now a citizen of independent Jamaica. That meant a great deal. Of course, the aftermath of that, since we, we have been paddling our own canoes, Trinidad has become oil poor, and Jamaica has become debt rich, DDT rich. And of course, other territories in the region who are not yet independent don't want to go that route naturally. Some of them are, are even very cynical and perverse in saying, look, they had us for three, four hundred years, let them continue to, take the, to carry the burden. And so the Turks and Caicos, uh, Montserrat, and um, the Cayman Islands remain colonies, though now called overseas territories. Of course, the French had um, anticipated that particular status, although they insist that Marti, Guadeloupe, Marie Galant, Guyane, Reunion in the Pacific are all integral parts of France. The differences in political systems are in fact part of the overall dilemma of difference, which is a manifestation of the complex process of diversity 
demanding of all in the region the capacity to build bridges not only between classes and races of people within countries of the region but also between zones of former imperial influences among countries and between continents of the world themselves represented in the region through centuries of migration and continuing interaction via tourism, commercial transactions, and of course, professional contacts. The Caribbean, itself the expression of such diversity and of its survival and beyond, has struggled for all of five centuries with mastering the management of the complexity of such diversity. And this is really where I feel we have some relevance because you here in Birmingham, in the United Kingdom, in the European Union, have got to get used to managing the complexity of the diversity. Such have been the phenomenon and challenges that today it is possible to say with a fair degree of certainty not totally, but a fair degree of certainty that we have by and large learnt in the Caribbean to live together rather than simply side by side, which is one of the problems you will find in many of the newer cultural diverse um, entities, that people can live side by side, but not necessarily together. But the communications technology revolution and the tremendous improvement in travel facilities have dictated the urgent need for people to learn, to live together, to deal with the dilemma of difference in ways that will serve the enhancement of the quality of life for human beings and to ensure positive human development well into our third millennium. The Europeans have come around to what the Caribbean has long understood to be a sine qua non of civil society. The world is our village, says a French intellectual. If one house catches fire, the roofs over all heads are immediately at risk. If any one of us tries to start rebuilding, the efforts will be purely symbolic. Solidarity has to be the order of the day. Each of us must bear his own share of the general responsibility. We are our brother's keepers. And indeed, since there are so many women in the audience, our sisters too. <laughs> My claim on behalf of the Caribbean may seem to some of you strange, against the background of a failed attempt on the part of the Anglophone segment to federate some four decades ago, and the ongoing difficulties we have trying to achieve effective modalities of closer cooperation between people who have shared a common history of slavery, the plantation, and colonialism. And I might add to that, since I've heard it enough since not only in Birmingham, but elsewhere in Britain, that we West Indians, yes, we are here, but we just don't stick together. We have as many organizations as there are countries in the Caribbean. The important thing is that the, the, the fight has not been given up in the Caribbean. We have CARICOM, they meet constantly, no more than it was in Europe after centuries of similar failures. Even now, I spend pounds in this country. I was elsewhere in Europe only 10 days ago and I was spending euros. The region at a substantial level a rather subliminal level, understands that trades on the unity which underlie the differences. The unity is said to be submarine by one of our West Indian poets, Kamau Brathway, and the region of limestone and volcanic rocks separated by divisive seawater. One can understand the metaphor and grasp the difficulties in transforming the creative diversity of floating island spaces colonial historical experiences and language differences into an integrated whole expressed in a common humanity. Admittedly, the eloquence of the differences is powerful. We continue to speak of the region of some 30 million people as Hispanic Caribbean, the Anglophone Caribbean, the Francophone Caribbean, 
the Dutch-speaking Caribbean, and so on. Such hyphenated fragmentation emphasizes the legacy of a heritage of separation and shattered identities. Yet none of this has deprived us in our separate dispensations of that awesome process of becoming. Our people were able to survive the traumas of separation from ancestral hearths as part of the transatlantic slave trade and the indignity of dehumanization in slavery for the vast majority by the exercise of their creative imagination. What results from this has been the germ of a culture which shares more in common than many like to believe. The products may differ one from another, but the region shares a similar process of becoming. And this is very obvious. CARICOM is finding that um, Cuba is certainly trying to get in there. Haiti is a member of CARICOM. Santo Domingo is an observer, as Cuba is. Suriname, which is Caribbean, has, has also joined. And even Brazil, because northern Brazil is very Caribbean, Bahia. And the Caribbean uh, music and what have is very popular there, and so on. So people do have a sense of that underlying unity through the products of the exercise of the creative imagination. Culture, then, as a point of power, and the recognition of this by these Caribbean dependencies catapult them into the 21st century precisely because they are in possession of that new sensibility forged over 500 years of encounters, making them fully au fait with relationships, with texture, with contradictions, with unity in diversity. All of these things together, though contradictory, have got to be pulled together, and that really is the challenge of any culturally diverse entity. The, and this is the creativity that has to inform it. The old Spanish Empire hankered after this, as did the Romans before them, with their e pluribus unum motto. But you can still declare the motto and not realize the unum out of the pluribus. If you don't um, have Latin, well, the Jamaicans made sure that they translated it, and their motto is out of many, one people. Of course, in Jamaica, you often, it depends who is speaking. You can, who is speaking, you can, if you have a sense of power there already, you might be saying, out of many, one people. If you don't, you are likely to say, out of many, one people, <laughs> and so on. Very complex. Even that we have had to deal with and are dealing with it. Today, there are parts of the world, and especially of this hemisphere, that celebrate their newfound perception in something called multiculturalism. I regard this as a piece of jargon we must be very careful of. Why? Somebody in Leicester the other night misunderstood me. But this is what I mean, the multi could well speak to a pluralism which secures for each ingredient in the mix an unassailable corner of exclusivity. So you stay in your small corner and I in mine. And if I am the powerful one, that means even more. You stay over there. I admit you are here. But I want to be here and want to have my position, which is the position of the corner of control. So one has to watch this very carefully. Vidya Naipaul recently came out very strongly. He took a line slightly different from myself. He, he typically Naipaul, he said, look, after all, you people have come here. What is all this nonsense about multiculturalism? You have come here, you come to the people's country, you must become the people. I don't believe that. I believe that as soon as there is an encounter, both start to influence each other, and both change. And as I have repeatedly said since coming to Birmingham, I have often said to my white audiences in the United States of America, 
as soon as you can come to terms with the notion that you are as negrified as I am Europeanized, then we are in business. That has, uh, in fact, made it vi very difficult um, for some people. But in fact, multiculturalism can leave the gaping gaps between cultures that are in encounter and not changing anything. Because the thing is the relationship, that is what you determine the dynamics, the true dynamics of the situation. And Edward Glisson, a Martinican writer, has said, in a very Frenchified way, we in the Caribbean have no myth of origin. What we have is a myth of relation. And that's true. Despite the, in fact, the very fact that you start quarrel and fight over power, means that you are relating, that you are conscious of a relating, of a relatedness, which um, multiculturalism doesn't necessarily um, provide you with. Such is the reality of the 21st century, which is already with us, as was the experience of all of the Americas, of which the Caribbean is an integral and iconic part. The world, world's inhabitants, certainly in the Western world to begin with, must now stand on mountain tops or on seashores, whatever, and say goodbye, motherland, because where you are is going to become home. This is part of the challenge in the exaggerated claims made by this or that civilization or culture with respect to the greatness of their creative achievements over all others especially over the formerly colonized and enslaved, but also over those who used to be regarded as the lesser races until the performance of such, some of such persons in the hallowed field of science and technology proved otherwise. The case of the Japanese here comes to mind. But Western Europe has also had to abandon notions of having a hotline to God in the form of Judaism and the Christian religion, leaving all others as heathens. Ecumenism has virtually won the day with Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam being rated as major religious expressions embracing the sympathy, faith, and formal allegiance of hundreds of millions of people on planet Earth who are not likely to burn in hell because they are pagans. And this is very important. I remember as a child growing up in Jamaica that everybody else was a heathen if he or she was the Christian. Now, since going to the University of the West Indies, of course, that was duly knocked out of my head. Needless to say that Pocomania and revivalism, which I jumped as a child, that was regarded as an aberration of Christianity. So at least one was in the fold. But when you go, many politicians in Jamaica have said time and time again, this is a Christian country. No politician in Guyana or Trinidad can say this is a Christian country because it isn't. And exclusively, neither is exclusively a Christian country. And in fact, some of the most spiritual experiences I have had in the University of the West Indies have been at interfaith services, where in fact all the denominate, rather re religious expressions are represented. And prayers are said in the different um, modes of um, expression. And we are none the poorer for it. In fact, one feels very elevated. In any case, my own study got me around to the understanding that in fact there's a Sermon on the Mount in every great religion. It's taking out the values which guide human existence. And this is really where the Rastafarians in responding to that kind of arrogance make sense. They created their own God. Why not? Others did before they did. And they, in fact, 
speak about the human being being divine. Again, others have done this. It's a wonderful basis for equality, for mutual respect, for self-esteem. All the things that an ex-slave society and an ex-indentured society hanker after. Outside of religion, exaggerated claims continue to be made in the realm of aesthetic discourse. What is classical is for many clearly European in the narrow view, while all else is popular or ethnic. That word ethnic, I, I wish it were expunged from the dictionary and the lexicon. You know, you get even our own people referring to ethnic cuisine, meaning the cuisine which is not European. They talk about in the tourist industry the ethnic trade, which means all non-white trade. Well, Poles and Englishmen, Scotsmen are, are all ethnic. ethnic. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, classic, I know a little about the dance. Classical ballet is ethnic ballet, is ethnic dance. The dance we do in the Caribbean is no more ethnic than the dance which is done at Covent Garden. Now these are things in the Caribbean, thank heavens, because we at least have some kind of political power on those rocks. We are able to determine ourselves because real power, real power are often de defined as the capacity to make definitions about oneself on one's own terms and to be, have the capability to proceed to action on the basis of those definitions. That's when you have power. You don't have power other than that. You have to be comfortable in your skin. That is a sign of power. And in fact, there are lots of people who can have power together in a culturally diverse society. And that's one of the things that the culturally diverse societies are grappling with because they do not come, they have not been able to come to terms with power sharing. And as in the case of physical migration of peoples from the developing to the developed world, there is, as Louise Bennett says, colonization in reverse in all of Western Europe in a deeply cultural sense. France and the Netherlands are hooked on Zouk. Zouk is the music the popular music that comes out of the traditional stuff of all those islands where France was once the master. And that is very popular, incidentally, in parts of France, certainly in, in the Netherlands. Of course, those Europeans who are hooked on Zouk are hooked on something else which shall be nameless. And that is also from the Caribbean. Um, British and German youths cannot do without reggae or dance hall, and the calypso of the Southern Caribbean has long taken root in the North Atlantic. You probably know, of course, that when the Berlin Wall was coming down, the young Germans sang Marley's Stand Up, Stand Up for Your Rights. And both Marley and Jimmy Cliff were very influential in the move, the move against apartheid in South Africa and, of course, in, for the freedom of Zimbabwe, um, of Southern Rhodesia, which became Zimbabwe. American pop music belongs to the world and the cinema, the great 20th century art form, serves to link continents. American jazz is easily the classical music of the 20th century, as the Europeans would aver. And Europe is wisely revitalizing its own great musical traditions by reaching out to the musics of Asia, the Pygmies, and South Africa to produce what they now call world music. This is indeed an example of a bridge between cultures being built and um, traversed. I once did a piece of choreography um, to Adiemos music. I don't know if any of you have heard Adiemos. But Adie, the woman who sings it, in fact, 
they did go to South Africa to get a feel of the close harmonies of South African music. And the woman who, it, who sings it, I think is a Yorkshire lady. She sings it perfectly. And I remember when I, when I was doing it, one of my more, more nationalistic black power-ish friends said, but why are you working to that, that music? That woman who is singing it is an English woman. I said, why not? Look at the Metropolitan Opera. See how many of them are singing Verdi? And those black ladies from Leontine Price right through have brought something new. I myself find it extremely difficult to listen, except for Joan Sutherland, to opera without that vibrato which the black women singers, um, sopranos, bring to it. So things, you cross fertilize and things change. And I was accustomed to this from, I was doing Shakespeare as a schoolboy. We are English people who came to evaluate this stuff, said so that you people sound more like Shakespeare than many of us in England. Now, how they know, God knows, because, you know, I'm reliably informed there wasn't electronic thing in those days, in Shakespeare's days. But anyway, I think it's the lilt and what have we, which comes naturally in the poetry. So, in fact, this kind of cross-fertilization, we are used to. We are used to, you get, um, Louise Bennett, in, when she was at Rada here in England, she played the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. And we, of course, in, in, in the Caribbean, will have maybe an Indian Juliet, a black Romeo, and a white whatever parent or so on because we are accustomed to this kind of thing we see this kind of cultural diversity and racial diversity and sometimes we are we take it so much for granted we don't understand until we come to a country like this when many of us discovered probably for the first time that we are black it hadn't occurred to us before that's how the world looks at us now, UNESCO sponsored a commission on culture and development, recognizing this in its declaration that with our futures being increasingly shaped by the interdependence of the world's peoples, it is essential to promote cultural conviviality. Look for the similarities rather than the differences. The truth is, the futures of people like us in the Caribbean were always shaped by the interdependence of those who found themselves in encounters of differing kinds. The slave master was highly dependent on the slave and vice versa. In fact, the emancipation of the slaves was the liberation of both masters and slaves since, to quote myself, the jailer and the jail are in jail. Just think about it. When the clerk decided that Mandela should be free, it was saying more about the clerk and his people than about Mandela and his, because he discovered that he was weighted down with the chain, the keys in the prison. Not only Mandela was in a prison, he was also. And in fact, they both faced the same challenge. You break down the walls. How are you going to live outside of that, um, of that prison? And the jailer and the jailed are in jail. This is why prejudice is so silly. To, be, to, 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 uh, to have indulge racial discrimination, it doesn't make sense because you have to make sure that your discrimination holds up. And um, this is something that we in the Caribbean have, um, have learned. Not fully, not all the, the implications, but enough of it. Derek Walcott, our 19, one of our Nobel laureates, he got it for literature in 1993. He puts it beautifully and graphically, and I quote, the tribe in bondage learned to fortify itself by the cunning assimilation of the religion of the old world. What seemed to be surrender was redemption. What seemed the loss of tradition was its renewal. What seemed the death of faith was its rebirth." 
End of quote. Such paradoxes of being, the world of the 21st century must understand, as we in the Caribbean throughout the past half a millennium have been forced to do. Any attempt to produce a new cultural hierarchy that will keep out hordes of humanity from the state of being human is likely to fail. And we are already getting signals which should be heeded. The signals are in the so-called globalization. Globalization in economic terms as its counterparts in the cultural field. But here is where it is likely to fail as that earlier globalization, otherwise known as imperialism, did. For the natural antidote to the poison of homogenization, which is what cultural globalization threatens, is the retreat to areas of specificity where people feel secure because they control the processes that make them viable. I refer to such areas as religion, the arts, and private philosophies about self and society. Caribbean society retreated to these areas with rich results in religion, in religious expressions, and the creative arts. Vital and performing, as well as homespun philosophy to be found in our oral literature, which houses the collective wisdom of our ordinary people. Storytelling is very important in the Caribbean. The Americas, the Americans have made an art form of it and they have societies where people go around and have contests in storytelling. Les Contes tradition in the French-speaking islands is something which um, it parallels the Anansi stories in Jamaica. And these are very important. In God's house, they show, there are many mansions. And a world which ignores the fact of plurality, of texture, of the human makeup, of the multifaceted nature of all living beings, and the systems and structures they create for their survival is not a world that is fit for human habitation. And I tell you that, in fact, this is something that the once powerful West has to come to terms with. Uh, a former president of Mali um, reminded the world back in 1993 that as long as any civilization applies political, intellectual, and moral coercion on others on the basis of the endowments, um, nature, and history of bequeath to it, there can be no hope of peace for humanity. The negation of the cultural specificities of any people is tantamount to the negation of dignity, of its dignity. And there is very much of this, a lot of this, in the regime change and the getting rid of Saddam syndrome in the Iraqi, U.S.-Iraqi war. There's absolutely many of them, many of the Islam people have relegated it to a jihad, a war on the basis of the redemption. And Mr. Bush, as like his father in the first Gulf War, has returned the compliment because there's a kind of Christian fundamentalism that comes through in the justification of the attack on Iraq by Mr. Bush. You know, anybody who feels that God is exclusively on his or her side, watch them. They're in trouble. Just as one has to watch the fundamentalism of the Islamists, so one should watch the fundamentalism of the Christians. Neither is good because you make no room for that diversity which is natural to human beings. A basic understanding of this is a primary ingredient in the bridges that have to be built between peoples tenanting different continents and tenanting different suburbs of this city. It's very, very important that that understanding be there. And I, who um, is in the academy, we have come to know, to understand that linear approaches to learning 
whether in teaching or research, will have to give place to the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach to the investigation, discovery, delivery, and diffusion of knowledge to cope with the intertextuality of the phenomena we are observing and analyzing. Texture, intertextuality, not multiculturalism. Interculturalism is what must be the answer. In everyday living, mutual respect and a commitment to the idea of the rights of one entailing the rights of all will have to be taken on board in the normal way of going about one's business. And this, this becomes increasingly important with, for people like us. In dealing with the wider social environment, whether local or global, one must be prepared to code switch at a moment's notice so as to be able to deal with the different modes of relating that confronts one within a matter of minutes, if not seconds. How can a child relate to the multiple images that will assault his consciousness on the television screen if he or she is to make sense of what he or she is viewing and of the world? You know, interestingly enough, one of the things about colonialism, there were some interesting things that came out of colonialism, is that all of us, certainly of my generation, I knew where every coal field in this country was. Mm. Happily, I had the sort of teachers who made sure that I knew where the rivers of Jamaica were, mm. and later on, where the rest, how the rest of the region relates to um, to us through the colonial experience. And one of the things I, I read Shakespeare, but I also read the dialect poems and the other poems of people who composed by people in, in Jamaica. Derek Walcott, we were at school together at university. He read all the classics in English literature. He also knew about the Creole traditions of St. Lucia. I remember when I first went to St. Lucia, I said, my God, Derek Walcott's work just came off the page like that. He knew his society because we belonged to the generation which started the thing for self-government. And these things were taught in schools for the first time. If you are brought up in the country too, you had to engage with your environment. There was no doubt at all. And you know, I had a little of the war, so I had to learn to eat yam and cocoa and banana instead of rice, which we didn't produce, and so on. So in a very real sense, that engagement with the environment helped us a great deal and made us textured, and we learned a great deal. I was saying to Chairman, Kelly, one of the, th and to um, Miss McIntosh, that one of the things that I noticed sadly missing in the reform recommendation, the recommendation for a reform of education in England, maths, English, ICT are regarded as general. nothing about learning about the cultural diversity of the society into which these kids have to graduate and how to deal with it. And not only this society, but Europe, the European Union, and indeed the entire world. And it seems to me that this is the kind of thing people like yourselves should insist on getting into the basic curriculum. You know, when they started women's studies, I used to say, look, it's not women's studies, that we need some men's studies. <laughs> And I, indeed, I gave the same, sim, a similar recommendation to people when they started black studies in the United States of America. I said, what is needed is white studies. It's the whites who need to know about black studies. The blacks know about themselves, and we know about the whites too, because that's all we have been doing, white studies. And therefore, it seems to me, of course, we have gone beyond that. I'm talking about cultural diversity creative diversity. And I feel this should be an integral part of the preparation of the young person to graduate into the kind of world which the 21st century is. Otherwise, racism, religious bigotry, 
xenophobia, apocalyptic rationalism parading as science, neoliberal bottom line e economics, which marginalize the very people who are the true producers of wealth, the commitment to culture of violent conflict rather than of peaceful engagement, all these obscenities continue to afflict humankind and threaten to thwart all attempts to span differences, real or imagined. As to the thing of violent conflict, you know, the whole Iraq like Vietnam, Iraq situation, you know, maybe a little learning is probably a dangerous thing, but when a fellow, a 17-year-old fellow is with a gun and goes around to rob and shoot and what have we, and I think to myself, what do I say to somebody like this? When he is seeing on the television, regime change because you're powerful, you go and bomb somewhere and get people out. The whole notion of conflict, of violent conflict, is something that needs to be expunged, starting at the local level, admittedly. But when you see all of this in the world at large, you have to think um, um, twice. Now, there was a report by um, on culture and development and by moving from UNESCO and by moving culture to center stage in the development process UNESCO genuinely felt that it could help to find one of the exceptional solutions needed at this time to the world's exceptional problems for the world as we indeed know it all the relationships we took as given are undergoing profound rethinking and reconstruction. Imagination, innovation, vision, and creativity are required. And um, the discourse continues, of course, as a, an important point of departure for people like ourselves, and as a framework for a series of bridges to span the river that flow between the cultural divide that separates segments of humanity, one from another, has been presented. Other material, of course, need to reinforce the framework or even to build more bridges. And the educational thing which I'm, I've touched on is critical. Go back to the young and let the young start from, the big, start from there in the schools. The family, people say, have broken down. But in fact, the family, yes, they are usually refer to the nuclear family. But there are lots of us who were brought up not in nuclear families and are not necessarily any the worse for it. Where an entire village decides to adopt you as its child, every adult in that village becomes a surrogate father or a surrogate mother. It happens also in some urban yards. Things are changing in the Caribbean, and particularly in the bigger countries like Jamaica, where grandmothers are so young now that they don't have any time to stay home and do a mind grand picnic. They want to go out too and have fun. That's a problem. That's a wider social problem. But the idea of the extended family is critical, and particularly in a place like this, the extended family, no blood relation. But the extended family is going to be critical for you to move from a position of strength in um, heightening and deepening the, um, the cultural diversity the, in a creative way in, um, in this, this city, in this country, in this continent. And in fact, our job then is really cut out for us. Down the 21st century. The shifting paradigms, the textured sense and sensibility of 21st century existence, and the, you see it in the youth, in our young people, who are bombarded with myriad images of self and society via the media, or through personal contact with persons of different backgrounds, races, and cultural origins, are all challenges to humankind's creative diversity which must be managed with sensitivity and daring. And the leaders in, among the so-called ethnic groups in a place like Birmingham or throughout the, the United Kingdom really have a real responsibility, a real responsibility in honing the sense and sensibility 
that can get in fact everyone, host and guests, together operating on the same wavelength. The things are contradictory, but such are the contradictions in the architectural designs and construction work that attend both the building of bridges across our classes, our races, our continents in the interest of human development and the imperative of creative management of the complexities resulting, or the complexity resulting. We cannot escape that and one has to think on that conceptual level. The good deeds that we do constitute the sprinting. The thinking about them and the conceptualization is the long distance running. And consider yourselves as co-architects of a culturally diverse space entity as being involved in long distance running. Can't give up hope. Hope springs eternal indeed. You can't give up. You just have to be there. As indeed we in the Caribbean, the job is nowhere yet finished. Independence came only 42 years ago, starting with Trinidad and, um, and Jamaica. And others joined after that. You cannot expunge from sen human sensitivity, sensibility, or experience 500 years of oppression in a matter of 40. But one can't give up. And as I said, even while one thinks on the past, it is not to get stuck in the past. It's just to use it as that rear view mirror that you know what's coming behind you to lick you. Or how you can, in fact, journey on the way forward. So I thank you yet again for affording me this opportunity for sharing these thoughts with you. Right. Now we're going to open it up for questions. That was quite a thought-provoking talk by the professor, and I do like the positive and optimistic note on which he ended. We cannot give up hope. In particular, he mentioned how many years of slavery and colonialization, and suddenly here we are within the Caribbean, 40 years of independence, say Jamaica, 42, some other islands, less than that. And having to cope with all of that, and the whole issue of mental slavery, how do we take those shackles away? Now, let's open this up for some serious discussion and debate after what was really a thought-provoking and rousing speech by the professor.